Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so very much for coming out this afternoon to welcome Betty, Way I'm waving at two of her <laughs> colleagues over here, Donna and Eileen, um, with her sixth Gunsu mystery. Now, have you seen a cuter cover? <laughs> I mean, when it's called the Panda of Death, you recognize this is not the panda you expected, right? <laughs> not a black and white big one, it's a little red one which is so much fun, but I really do love the way his tail curves around, or her is the case, maybe. Yeah, her. It's a her, isn't it? It is a her, yes. Yes, and her name is Punya, and she was, uh, people sometimes wonder how zoos wind up with the animals they have. In her case, she was a family pet of someone in um, India, and in which they're very, actually, Indira Gandhi had several red, red pandas for pets. So once this woman passed on to that great forever, uh, since she knew um, the, the people at the Gun Zoo, she left Punya to the Gun Zoo with, with the stipulation that she gets petted for at least 45 minutes every day. <laughs> so, and that winds, up being, that winds up being my zookeeper's job is to, when she gets through feeding everybody else, she goes over to Pit Punya's enclosure, sits down, Punya crawls up in her lap, and then it's less at the, the, the panda time. So it's Just like our puppy, who regards my husband's whole impressive stretch of yeah. stomach as, yeah. as her personal bed. So he reads the paper every morning like this with our, yeah. with our dog. It's wonderful. So yeah. I understood look about how Punya. Look their tails are. They have very thick hair, yeah. very thick. And the tails are just, well, those of you, how, how many of you have read The Anteater of Death and you've seen the pictures of the big old tail of the anteater? Well, the Punya, she has a tail almost as big as, as a giant anteater, except she's small. She's like a little, kind of a, a little bigger than, than a house cat, but not much. So what drew you to, to Punya or to a red panda for your story? I had absolutely no intention of using her. I didn't even know what a red panda was. My husband and I were in San Francisco, and we, wherever we're going, we always visit the zoo. So there we are at the San Francisco Zoo. And I, 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 so I have a thing for lemurs. You will finally find a lemur. Um, but I'm looking for the lemurs, can't find the lemurs, and I'm looking, and then I see something reddish go whoop, bye. And I look at it, and I look at it, what, is that? Is that a loose cat? And then. I look more and then I finally see the little sign, Red Canda, comma, Firefox. That's their, their other name. And I, it was love at first sight. I mean, I just, and, and the caper was coming in to the, to the I'm gonna continue to call it the panda. Uh, the, the zookeeper was coming into the panda's uh, enclosure at that time. And the panda ran over to him, it was a guy in this case, ran over to him, stood up on his hind legs and started scratching at the guy's legs. And I thought, oh, I gotta do something about this. And so I've been planning it ever since. How wonderful, does Punya have any bad habits? No, she's an angel. <laughs> <laughs> she, no, no bad habits whatsoever, although she does eavesdrop. Yes, yeah, she does. I asked because some of the animals in your earlier books have had some embarrassing habits. Mm -hmm. this, <laughs> Punya is an angel. She, 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 I mean, she, Punya is exactly how she looks. Absolutely adorable. So you truly are besotted. Okay, yeah. all right, we've yeah. established that. Um, you have a personal story that lies behind the plot in oh, this book. Yeah, well I had, I, I, I guess I was about a quarter of the way through writing The Panda of Death. Uh, and uh, what I had done, I, genealogy has always been kind of my thing. And uh, because my, my mother's side of the family are from the, the old, old Scots family with the titles and the whole thing. And my mother and my father's side of the family are just dirt poor farmers. So it was really fun to go back into the history. And then, suddenly, everybody was getting their DNA tested. And I thought, oh, now I can really find out about the family. This would be fun. So I got my DNA tested. And um, one day, I'm sitting there uh, writing, writing on this book, and the phone rang. 
and it was one of my cousins in Alabama. And I always know when my Alabama folks are calling to say, hi there, Betty Jo, are you there? <laughs> and I, and it, it, yeah. So I said, yeah, 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 I'm here. I, well, what you got? He said, listen, I've I got a story for you. He had had his DNA checked too, and he says, I found out, Betty Jo, that I have got a first cousin I did not know I had. And I said, well, if he's your first cousin, then he's gonna be my first cousin. And he said, no, Betty Jo, he's your brother. And I said, what? And um, so my family, my, my father's side of the family, which is where this guy wound up, my father's side of the family, three quarters of them are church-going people that you would be proud to have over for dinner. The other quarter of them, not so much. <laughs> and they, they, they don't kill anybody, but, but <laughs> short, of, short of that, you know, uh, you'd be, you'd want to, if they came over to, for dinner, you'd want to check the silverware after they leave. Good grief. So I found out, yeah, I looked at my own DNA results more carefully. See, I, I, I hadn't even just bothered to look at them much. And uh, yeah, sure enough, it was on my dad's side. And so right away that made sense because my dad is, he was the black sheep of the black sheep side <laughs> of the family. And um, I got a little nervous uh, because I thought, you know, do I really want to know this guy? I mean, he's probably in prison. Um, but. I thought, well, you know, what the heck? If he's in prison, I can learn a lot about prisons, you know, because I could visit. Really useful. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. useful. Very useful. Um, so I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, and I thought, okay, that's it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call because I was given a phone number, and turns out he was as nervous about me as I was about him, because we both do what. Well, actually. I knew what my father was like, but he was under the impression somebody else was his father. He did not know that my dad was his dad, so we had a lot of fun. And uh, I showed him a picture of his real father, and he said, am I supposed to change my name now? Uh, but he came out here, he, he rented a uh, one of these uh, Airbnb houses, a real big one, and brought his entire family out here. And we got to know each other. He stayed here for two weeks, and it was wonderful. Oh. He's probably, he and I are probably the only non-criminals on that side of the family. <laughs> so it, 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 was, it was really That's great. That's only because you write about them instead of actually mm -hmm. doing it. Well, yeah, but it, it's, it's, it's my, I, I do have that criminal tendency. <laughs> since, since I write about it, I don't have to do it. Exactly. Yeah. No, you just sublimated yeah. it. Yeah, so we, we had a great time. And um, now the interesting thing was, on his side, he had a family, he, he had eight children, and um, they were all either musicians, artists, or writers. And it's, so there was something, yeah. some kind of DNA that my dad was carrying that was actually Okay, <laughs> non-criminal. So I thought, it, it, and at that time, back to the book, I was hunting around for a good for a good subplot because you know you always have a big plot, the big you know the big killing, who did it and why and all that. But you've got to have a good subplot too. And I thought, I know, I know, we're going to have a DNA surprise. So I did. So I wrote that into the book, but I changed it a little bit because. I wasn't sure how my brother, my new brother, would feel uh, about being used as is in a book, so I just changed it around. But then I wound up, you know, dedicating the book to him. So and, and they're thrilled. And they, they, you know, the person missing from this tale is your brother's mother. Who clearly had a secret to keep. Oh, so where is she in all this? I, yeah. Well, there. <laughs> The story he told me was that there was a big poker party one night, and my dad was there, and other people were there, and she was there. And my dad was a very handsome man, a handsome man who always drove cream-colored 
Cadillac convertibles. He had a real gift for the ladies. And um, so he seduced her at the poker party. Is I'm not sure. Saying? It was much of a seduction, actually, <laughs> because he was, you know, she was pretty. He was handsome. There was love in the air. <laughs> and a baby. And a baby. And a baby. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of articles on, about the ethics and the consequences of DNA testing. A lot of surprises, mm -hmm. some of which have not been welcome. Um, and some good ones. I mean, yeah. Betty's tale is a happy tale, no, but there really are certainly yeah. other ones that are not. And I'm trying to think, was it Faye Kellerman or was it Michael Chabon's wife that wrote a story about a similar sort of thing, but it's an ugly story. It oh. didn't It didn't go well. Oh, um, too bad. And so, you know, for somebody, was his mother, has his mother passed on too? So she uh, wasn't yeah. alive for all this? Yeah. Well, she, he thought her husband was his father. No, I know, but were they still living? Oh, no, no. Uh -uh. So that's uh -uh. easier, and, but yeah, what if they yeah. were alive and yeah. all of this were revealed? Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a whole different yeah. question. Yeah. So it's easier to be clinical if everybody's gone. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it couldn't have gone any better. I mean, for, because of the way they are, that, that side of the family, uh, we spent the entire, almost the entire two weeks going to museum after museum after museum in art studio. I guess it was great. Well, all right, so back to back the to two zoo. Yeah. So Teddy is now <coughs> married to Joe. Yes, Teddy is now married to Joe, and uh, they're all living very, very nicely. The grandma's house is now finished. It's in the back, and um, she, the, the mother-in-law, Teddy's mother-in-law, is now a famous mystery writer. I wonder if I got that idea. And... Um, She's the one who decides to check her own DNA and finds out that, no, no, she doesn't take, she, yeah, she does check it, but at the same time, this 18-year-old boy in Southern Cal California is checking his, and then they find out his was kind of, his, his situation was kind of the same situation that happened in my family except this was a high school prom with spiked punch. And, um, yeah. It's wonderful how you give them an out, you know, alcohol, oh, you have to, whatever. See, what about just lust, you know? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you always need an excuse. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm not like that. I'm not really like that. I was drunk. You know, eh. I don't know. I think it's better if you're sober. I, don't <laughs> I mean, it's just me, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather, anyway, whatever. Um, so you do construct. I don't want to give much away here, but you you do construct a story where suddenly the family has a new they a meet. new member yes, that they, has they to meet. be dealt with. They meet. And now, whereas in my own particular case, I don't look much like my brother. And which, well, we're both redheads. Believe it or not, before this happened to me, I was a redhead. And his hair is now as white as mine, but he was a redhead. And his, but see, the snag is my dad was a redhead, and my brother's mother was a redhead. So she was married to another guy who was my father's business partner. Oh. Yes. And, um,. <laughs> <laughs> but, so when the kid in the book, when the kid shows up at, at Teddy's door, she takes one look at him and knows, oh my God, he looks just like my husband. So I had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> oh, yes, torturing people is one of the prerogatives of being a writer, right? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> meantime, meantime, let's go back to the main plot, which we don't want to say much about it, but Inevitably, somebody discovers a body. Yeah, there's a there's there's a really terrible, awful man in it in the book. He's a screenwriter, Hollywood screenwriter. Not hard to make them terrible and awful. Um, and somebody kills him. And the the way that that uh, the way that Teddy gets uh, thrown into the the mix is that the the dead screenwriter winds up floating in the gun zoo, gun harbor right next to Teddy's boat, the Merrily. And of course, he's floating back and forth on bam, 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 you know, against the hull of her boat. And they call the police. And since it's her boat, 
she has to be questioned. So as it turns out, he lived at the harbor on a boat and had offended, let's, let's use a softer word, uh, had offended just about everybody at the harbor. And uh, so right there we have a lot of suspects. But then he was writing a, he was writing scripts for a, a children's theater, a children's program, a TV program, and uh, called Tippy Toe, let's see, Tippy Toe and Tinker, Tippy Toe and Tinker, uh, the old-fashioned marionettes. Remember the kind with the strings? Because mm -hmm. I wanted to use those. I, the hand puppets, the Muppets, you know, they've been used a lot, but I wanted the old-fashioned ones. And uh, so he, he was the, the dead man, was the screenwriter for this particular show, Tippy Toe and Tinker. And Tinker, I'm not sure is the word. I changed the name several times because, oh, and here's something. Here's <laughs> advice for those of you who are writing mysteries or anything. What you need to do, if you're making somebody really, really evil, you need to check to make sure that their name does not match somebody else in the <laughs> same field. Also, the, the TV program that I had, I started out with a totally different name and it turns out there was a TV program by that name. So, oh. yeah, yeah. It this, is Tippy Toe and Tinker. It is tip, Tippy Toe and Tinker. Okay, it was originally something else. And uh, so, they, you know how it is when you have a little children's program that's local, nobody's making much money, nobody's getting rich. But by some strange quirk <laughs> of fate, they got syndicated. And the minute they got syndicated, that changed the dynamics of the entire cast. And everybody there had a good reason to kill the scriptwriter. So it was a lot of fun. This is probably <laughs> one <laughs> like, crime writer would say that, right? I, I, I like killing people. I really, I really do. And, uh, and, 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 and one of my favorite ways of killing, you know, is bashing in the head with a crowbar. I got to do that again, and I loved it. It was really nice. Um, and I think I wound up with something like three dead people by the end of the book, but I... Like there was a body count. No yeah, there was a body count. Yeah. Yeah. Suspects, yeah. You know? It's yeah. a very interesting plot. It's a clever plot. Oh, yeah. Um, I really love Marionette. Some years ago, my husband and I were traveling before the Frankfurt Book Fair. We wound up on the Bodensee, which is a lake between Germany and Switzerland, on Sunday night. And there was nothing to do, we thought. Um, but we were wandering around and we came upon a sign that said the magic flute tonight at 7 at the puppet oh. theater. Turns out this was a really famous puppet theater. So I'm passionate about Mozart, so my husband knew what fate was in store for him. Um, so we went back um, and lined up behind all the people who actually had tickets at the box office at quarter to 7. And by chance they had two tickets left on opposite sides oh, of the wow. theater, but who cared? Right. Um, so anyway, they did the magic flute with these wonderful marionettes. It was fabulous. The glockenspiel was a marionette of his own. So they would go along and Pavino would sing, and then you know, and then the glockenspiel would dance and go. Burr, burr, and goes. Anyway, afterward, they invited us all backstage so we could see um, the marionettes and the people that um, you know manipulated them with the strings and all. It was it was truly magical, and it's still. A very popular thing in Germany, whereas yeah. I didn't see so much yeah. of it in other places. But in, in Europe, Germany, they have maintained the puppet theater, yeah. you yeah. know, um, and people flock to see it. I mean, it's a completely yeah. sold out performance. Yeah. Uh, I had to do a little research on marionettes. And what surprised me were that the ancient Greeks had marionettes. Mm -hmm. and But the, the controlled bar, I think they, that's what they call them, uh, they were very simple. You just did like that and you you controlled your puppet, your marionette. Now they're very complicated. And so it takes quite a bit of time to to learn how to do that. But it is a fascinating art and I'm I'm sorry that we, we no longer see much of it here. Right. The puppets are amazing. They're really yeah. lifelike and yeah. as they say I'll forever love the Lockenspiel but um because I've, I've seen the magic flute probably 30 times at the Met and all over the world. Never have I seen the, the, the glockenspiel <laughs> as its own thing, you know? It's just the orchestra, but you know, to have it as the puppet, and yeah. it danced, 
you know, and <laughs> like yeah. this. It was just amazing. Yeah, but when I, when I was a kid, it did, I think some of you are old enough to remember this one program, How Do You Do Time? Oh, good. Uh, all right. Do you remember, do you remember the uh, flub a -dub? Yes. No. Yep. flub a -dub was the platypus, Doug Bill platypus, mm -hmm. and was a was an old-fashioned marionette. And you could buy that marionette. And I saved up my allowance, and I bought flub a -dub. Yeah. And so when I was a kid, I was always out there with flubbing them. And uh, remember how he did? He would dance in. Oh, I you know, know how he did. He was, <laughs> and his jaw was hinged. Remember, so yeah, his jaw yeah, yeah, up and yeah. down. Yeah. They Buffalo Bob. Yes. Buffalo Bob. Buffalo Bob. Yes. What was the clown? Clown. 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 Yeah. Oh my gosh, we are old. Probably have rerun still on TV. It was. It really was. Because my brother was absolutely and trance with it. And yeah. in those days, you walked home for lunch from school. And when in yeah. Illinois, it was not a, a huge walk home. And he would come home, and my mother would fix him lunch, and he would be glued to watching Howdy Doody, you know? Yeah. Then we'd yeah. go back. And that was the first show I ever saw, Howdy Doody yeah. yeah. Show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, Punch and Judy was yeah. always a very big, um, sometimes mm -hmm. they do it with hand puppets, yeah. but Punch and Judy was a marionette show, yeah. I think, in Europe. Oh, Originally, I've oh, yeah. seen they, Punch and they Judy were in Germany. Sad oh, they, they were, were sadistic, puppets. too. Yeah. Yes. 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 Whoa. Lots of banging wood. Oh, you know, yeah. yeah. Boy, yeah. 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 Very cruel. Beheadings and all that. So, Puna, if I remember right, had a particular little language. She's very big on eek. Yes, eek. Um, you're talking about Punya. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you go on to, you, you know everything is on the internet. So just, just look up Firefoxes and you will see films with sound of Firefoxes running around going eep, eep, eep. <laughs> they, but they actually have a, a vocabulary. They, but I kept using eep, eep because it was so cute. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, we've had six animals. R review. We had the anteater was first, that, right? The anteater, then there was koala, Chihuahua. then there was wow. the llama. Wasn't the llama? Llama, llama. llama. yeah, llama was second, I think, and koala was third, is that right? Yeah. I thought I think llama so. was third. Yeah. Lama was there. And then Puffin and then Otter. Yeah, Puffin and Otter. And then yeah. White Lama Otter. Oh, you know how we can find out? We can look in the book. We can look, <laughs> in, the book. Yeah, we can look right. in the book. But each, each of the books has had a truly memorable animal in your own time at, okay, it's Anteater, Koala, Lama, Puffin, and Otter, just as you say. And yeah. now, yeah. uh, the panda. Um, I, how do you say, I mean, you just, Loved each of these animals. Yeah, I, I, I have an interesting collection because there's no really common thread except no, all in there isn't. It's it's whatever works on my heart at the particular time. <laughs> now the interesting thing is, probably my favorite place to go when I visit the zoo. You know, I was a volunteer here at the Phoenix Zoo. Is is to see the lemurs. They're they're like my favorites. But I haven't written the lemur of death yet, which is odd. But I never really have a plan as to what animal I'm going to use at the time. Yeah, I generally know who I'm going to kill. I mean, most mystery writers do start off with with the death, you know, they you, and and how that happens. This is a secret I'm going to let you all in on. Um, somebody makes us mad, and we since it is against the law to kill people. We walk around, we were mystery writers, we walk around with a big grievance. And the more we think about the, the evil that that person did us, the madder we get. And we just get so mad, we just finally think, well, the only way out of this is to kill them. And so that's what we do. We, actually, I have killed the same person three times. <laughs> and I will kill her again. Um, former boss of mine. Former boss. And so I, start, I, I always start off with, with the, the person who's getting killed. And I generally kill people who deserve it. I don't like killing the innocent. I like killing the real rot, rot gut, no goodness. And um, so I start with that. And then the animal generally comes to me on its own. 
I don't sit and think about what animal. It's just that I will be at my computer one morning. You know, those of you guys who know me know that I get up sometimes around four or five in the morning and I start writing then. And um, I'll be writing a, a, a paragraph and then suddenly an animal sticks its nose in there. And then there's the animal. And that's, there was one that I did, chip, uh, one, the puffin of death. I had always wanted to go to, to Iceland. And uh, I couldn't figure out how I could afford going to Iceland because it's not a cheap place. And then I thought, hmm, what kind of animals does Iceland have? Because, you know, it, eh, it's tax deductible. Uh, but I got started <laughs> thinking about Iceland. Because, remember your 4th of July sales here, your book sales? There was a book over there on, on that wall, and it was uh, about Iceland, and it was July, and it was something like 130 degrees out, mm -hmm. and the cover of that book, there was this big ice flow, and I thought, I, that's what I'm reading, took it home, and it, it was based, it was a mystery based in, uh, in Iceland, and I thought, okay, that's it, I'm going to kill somebody in Iceland. And, <laughs> Then I tried to figure out, how, how am I going to get an, an American killed in Iceland? I mean, that's kind of hard. And then I'm thinking, okay, tourist, yeah, no, we'll kill a tourist, an American tourist. <laughs> and how am I going to get my, my zookeeper in Iceland? I don't know. See, most people don't realize how, how carefully plotted you have to be for a mystery no novel. Yeah. Because there has to be a good reason for everything. You can't just have everybody suddenly wind up in Iceland. So I put a lottery winner in there, and then at the same time, he, that, I think it's the lottery winner, yeah, the lottery winner gets, oh dear, I better not even go there, I can't, oops, I'm starting to say too much. Oops. <laughs> An Arizona lottery winner, I might add, right? Yes, sure is an Arizona Iceland. lottery winner. Surprisingly, in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you can actually run into a lot of Americans in Iceland in the summer, as I have done. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a great place for those of you that, that those of you who are kind of worried about going to Iceland because it seems so cold. Not in the summer. In the summer, it's around seventy degrees, and it's just wonderful. And they all speak English. They speak English much better than we do <laughs> because they're taught how to speak English from the first grade on. Mm. And uh, you know how Americans are. We say things like, well, I'm going to the store now. But they will say things like, I am going to the store now. I shall see you later. It's really weird, but they're nice. <laughs> they are nice. They also have, for years, have the highest literacy rate of any nation. That's right. Um, That's so right. Um, they have a lot of writers, many of whom are now translated into English. Yep. So we've had some here. Ragnar Janusson yep. was here last year. Yeah, I saw There's him. There's a Sears yeah. daughter. Um, yeah. oh, I can't remember uh, the guy that wrote the first one that everybody paid attention to. I'm having a English. Arnold Arnolder in Bridison. Oh, right? yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It's very good, and there's some others. So it's there, actually fun to read mysteries set in Iceland. Yeah, and here, here's the odd thing about mysteries set in Iceland. They have the lowest murder rate in the world. And, but you, you'd never know that from reading their books because they're really, really gory. Uh, I, I mean, you, they don't just shoot them there. They just, they generally draw and quarter them and drag them behind horses or something. It's, it's the more blood, the merrier. But I was at a, um, at a conference, mystery conference, and they had this one Icelander up there uh, on a panel and so you know how the audience asks all questions. And some smart aleck in the audience, I think her name was Betty, <laughs> stood up and said, question, question. And he said, yes. And I said, Iceland has the lowest murder rate in the world. So how can you write these mysteries? And his answer was, I kid you not, was, well, we fantasize a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they also have a really good um, crime festival in November. I'm trying to remember what it's called. Yeah, Reykjavik. Reykjavik. Is it the Reykjavik? They, it's it, called it, something like Something Nights. Yeah, Reykjavik Nights, I think. Icy Nights. Icy Nights. Bloody Nights, whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> if you want to go to Iceland, if you went in November, you could actually attend a crime conference. I think it's yeah. every other year. but. 
I've always wanted to go yeah. in November and see the Northern Lights because they're yeah. not that visible in the summer. No, we were there. We were there. I think it was in August, and yeah, that's right. It was because it was on my birthday, where I got my birthday tattoo in Iceland. Uh, I went in. Oh, here's a story. I knew I wanted the the tattoo, and I had looked up uh, 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 in a book of uh, Icelandic tattoos. So take a look at this. This is uh, the Icelandic compass, and um, it was what the Vikings used to go out and rape and pillage Europe. So here it is. So I, I had a picture. You're sticking to her theme all the way through. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know. And you have, to, you have to remember my DNA. Um, so I, I finally I make a, a copy of of the the tat, of, of the compass. And so my husband and I are walking down the street and we see a sign, Reykjavik Tattoos. And it was actually on my birthday. So I go into the, it was my first day in, in Iceland. In the morning I'd been out riding the Icelandic horse, of course. And, and then, so we go into the tattoo parlor and I have my drawing of this tattoo. Remember, my first day in Iceland. And so I show the guy behind the counter the picture of my, the tattoo I want. And I said, I would like you <laughs> to put this on my wrist. And he looked at me and he said, well, sure, honey, I can do that for you right away. <laughs> <laughs> he was from, uh, he, he was from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant. It yeah, was it was meant, yeah, because my family's from Alabama, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, oh, anybody have questions they would like to ask Dave? Are you going to do another animal one? I don't, I don't know. Uh, right now I'm working on an, a new series uh, that's set in a very different place with a very different uh, type of uh, detective. Uh, we shall say Paris and artist, that kind of thing. And it's also a historical. Um, I, and I, I don't know, but I've been dreaming of sloths lately, so <laughs> I just don't know. The ideal know. character for a mystery, right? You sleep right through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the good news is that um, Betty has left Joe and um, Teddy. Joe Teddy, Teddy. Thank you, having a blank here. Um, in a very good place with their family, so if they yeah. take a little rest here, yeah. you know, you don't need to worry about them, and that's always always yeah. good thing yeah. to do, right? Yeah, that's right. And another thing to remember about writers is they say, "Oh yes, I planned it." And I, no, most of us do not plan what we're going to write. We just get up one morning, we say, "Oh, I think I'm going to write a book about a horse," and by the time we're done, it's a goat. So that's just the way it is. We, we, we think we plan, but then we wind up not really planning. Other than, oh, I think I better go to the, ty the, to the computer and write. That, that never changes. Okay. Anybody Questions? else? In uh, the Iceland. Yeah. You mentioned that the, uh, the Vikings came from Iceland. Uh, yeah, a lot of the Vikings did come from Iceland, and I also found out, this is exciting folks, um, I also found out that I have apparently Iceland in my DNA, so that, that may account for my savagery. <laughs> They were all over Scandinavia. They were oh, in Norway, which is coastal, like Norway. but there were but there were some in Iceland. I mean, if you yeah. into the Faroe Islands, you can understand why they sailed away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, it was um, the thing about them was they were absolutely terrific sailors. Yeah. I mean, they mastered building their boats. There's right. a wonderful museum in Oslo that you can go visit which is three Viking longboats, and they're yeah. just technologically amazing. Ones. Gorgeous. Um, and if Gorgeous. you think about them out there on the open Atlantic, yeah. you know, and these boats going to Ansley Meadow is the one place in North America yeah. we know for sure. It's on the tip of Canada, up above Labrador, and you can only go there, but you could go there by land, but that's so difficult, it's way better to go there by boat. Um, I've been there, and it's absolutely gorgeous, but they had sod house technology so they could build things and stay warm if they could get through the ice and they were great sailors and you know but they were also into rape and pillage so yeah. they, have a, they don't have a great reputation yeah. but they were surprisingly um, um, 
in terms of um, navigation, they were surprisingly great mariners and navigators yeah. and all the rest of them. Yeah. And they settled in Greenland for a while, but climate change drove them out. You know, because the world has actually heated thought. I'm not denying, I'm not a climate denier. I really think mm -hmm. it's changing right in yeah, front of us. Um, but it has over, you know, we're just accelerating it. But um, the Vikings actually had a big foothold in Greenland where I have been yeah. to see them. And then it froze up again because there was an ice age in the 1500s when the Thames froze and people were ice skating on the river and the whole bit. Um, and so they were driven out of Greenland. And now Greenland is thawing and now you can actually take a cruise around Greenland. I know, which is just amazing. So the rate in which it's all thawing is hugely accelerating. That's scary. Very, and unfortunately um, for for a lot of reasons, there's an enormous amount of um, mineral and other other valuable things under the ice. And so as the ice is thawing, these are countries that are gonna be ripe for exploitation, like the Amazon, because there's a lot of great stuff there, you know, to dig out if people want to do that. So maybe we'll just buy it. He was taking a long view of it. We yeah. could, you know, <laughs> take the oil and all that. But I mean, it's it's too bad because it's been a pristine environment for so long, and now it's changing. And, you know, the Icelander, by the way, are they're very very protective of their environment, very much so. They're they're very sophisticated. But at the same time, they have not lost some of their old beliefs. For instance, um, there was a, a highway, a new highway they were building. And then they, they started looking at the map, the engineers, and realized they couldn't build the highway through one particular area. And the reason they could not build the highway through that one particular area is because that was, that was the area where the gnomes lived. Gnomes, G-N-O-M-E-S. Yeah, and they, they still believe in them. They, they're called the hidden people. And um, so you just think, you, ha you have all these wonderful engineers, these extremely sophisticated modern people. If you ever go to Reykjavik, you'll know what I mean when I say sophisticated. Wow. Um, and yet, they won't, build a highway through the gnomes. Country, right? Yeah, I, I, I just think that's the weirdest thing and I love it, I love it. Yeah. Uh, another question. When, um, and back into the book about Iceland, when she, the zoologist and the woman that she meets just befriends her and they're staying together in her, her apartment and they go out, they all go out for an evening mm -hmm. and you commented in the book about um, the social status as far as possibility of intermarriage. It, oh, you know, yes. Watch, Here, here's like another interesting thing. Now, Iceland is a small country, and there's only about 350,000 people in it. And they were all founded by the same, let's say, 16 Vikings. All right? So we're talking a little bit, you have to kind of be care, careful who you get involved with. So they have to. Some engineer in Iceland has built what is called, well, it's, it's, well, it, it's a red light alert. Is you take your cell phone, it, let's say you've met somebody at a bar. They drink a lot up there too. You met somebody at a bar and he's, oh man, he's, he's tough. Oh, he's good looking. Oh, what a Viking. Oh, wow, wow. And you wanna play around a little bit with this wonderful guy. And so you take out your phone and he takes his phone, and you touch the phones together. And if there's an alarm, he's your cousin. That is true. That is, it's called the ins, it's called the incest alert. <laughs> the incest <laughs> alert. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, we have that right here in Arizona. Like the Navajo do exactly the same thing. If you've read Tony Hillerman, you will know all about it. Um, they have plan because. They were able to conclude by observation, like not by science, that intermarriage was genetically an unsound practice. That's the real danger of polygamy. Mm -hmm. That what Betty's, Betty's yeah. book about Desert Wives, about the polygamists, the thing that's tragic is that they have so many damaged children because of inter, intermarriage. So 
you know, it's anyway, centuries of observation led them to figure out a clan system, but I didn't know that it was electronic. I know that in the Navajo country, they, they actually have it all worked out in a different way, but you have to be careful. I think that's also true in parts of Polynesia and so forth, where there are just too few different family lines, and so you have to be extremely careful about intermarriage. Right. And they're not shy about it in Iceland. Not at all. They'll just look, oh, you're cute. Oh, you're cute, too. Hey, let's check phones. And that's it, you know, and they're just not shy it's just foreplay right yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love it well it's kind of like why why waste the foreplay if yeah. you're gonna have to walk away yeah. <laughs> that's true why waste point. it hey, it's that, very practical uh, yes, maybe yeah. a line i'm going to use in one of my books i like that a lot why waste the foreplay anyone else have a question we should get away from sex and move on to like killing people once again so forth yes i have a question um, do you ever find yourself like uh, you're typing out your new book, you know, you're writing on it, and you've got lots of ideas, and then all of a sudden you think of something, and then you realize, oh, I've got to get rid of that because that was from the the last book I just wrote. It happens you know, all the time. It okay. happens all the time. Writing is one of the hardest professions in the world because you can do anything in print. Mm -hmm. And half the time it's going to be wrong, nice. so it's 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 really tough. And you you, and then oh, there's a, there's a a lot of times I will find I'm repeating names of somebody that I used in an earlier book, mm. but it's a different character. Nice. So I, I I just but I'm very very lucky. Uh, in fact, you're writing, aren't you? No, I'm you're not. You're not. Oh well, uh -huh. fool me. Um, <laughs> Here, here's what I do. Uh, I belong to a critique group. In fact, we've got a couple of my members right here. Uh, when I do something stupid like that, like I've got another person, like I've got three people with the same name, mm -hmm. right? My critique group will say, you've got three people with the same name. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's terrific. So they keep me from some, making some of the worst mistakes I could make. And then my, my editor over here, takes care of the rest. Your editor would notice if you had three people. <laughs> I promise you she will notice. <laughs> but see, the thing to remember is, with me, I start writing around four in the morning, mm -hmm. and I'm just not all quite there at four in the morning. The creativity is there, and the plot's moving along just great, but the common sense of it is not there, because I still have sleep. Yeah. Okay. Thank Might you. be a better way to write, sort of in a fugue state. Yeah. Then, you know, That's right. It up. right yeah. That's an interesting point. Anyone else? Well, in that case, I want to thank you all very much for coming out this afternoon to welcome Betty. And this is, as I said, the launch of her book, The Pain of Death. So you are here for it. I'm going to, as Eleanor approaches us, I'm going to say goodbye to our Facebook audience and thank you for joining us.